Thank you very much. Always when you get introduced and they say all these things, you say, that's me? <laughs> you know, I don't, it went by so fast, I don't even. Okay, I have 20 slides, no, no, I have 10 slides in 20 minutes, so, so I've got two minutes for slides. So at some point, uh, we'll get started here. Central American, yeah, there we go. Okay. Which, where do I change the slides here? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so my presentation is giving you background on the Central American migrant youth, and so Let's get into that, right? First thing I want to do is look at numbers, and I know this are very small here, and I apologize for that, but I just wanted to show you something here, and that something is uh, we hear a lot of big numbers, but a big chunk of the big numbers, like up till June of, of this summer, a big chunk included uh, Mexican children that come over. Uh, so. We had like 12,000 Mexican unaccompanied youth that came over and apprehended by Border Patrol. And the Mexican children used to send right back. Uh, they're not placed in detention centers as such. And so they, there's a special arrangement between the U.S. and the Mexican government. So if we take away the Mexican children we're, and we drop down to Central Americans and we're looking at the most numerous, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, we're at about 39,000 of those kids, unaccompanied, meaning they came by themselves without adults, uh, or they arrived without adults. Um, usually, the, the large majority are from like 15 to 17, 14 to 17, maybe 80% or something like it varies, and then the rest can be even younger, right? Including, uh, there have been cases of babies who are carried over by older children who are themselves are minors. Okay, so I've seen those cases as well. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, the big, the big, big numbers often include the Mexicans, which Mexican children are uh, the big numbers for the longest time with the Mexicans. What's happening now is that the Central Americans are catching up to the Mexican numbers of children on a company, and the Mexicans are going down for reasons I, I don't, I don't know. Okay, so when we look at the at the Central American unaccompanied children or youth, we see that there's a fluctuation. Some years are high, some years are lower, but then it's been growing since 2012 for the Salvadorans. And in, in one year, 2013 to 2014, if we look at it by month, they increased by about 170%. So there's a, a surge of Salvadorans. The big surge is on the, the youth coming from Honduras with it increased by 214% most recently. And the Guatemalan children are about 122%. So numbers are increasing, they fluctuate. I've been studying Central American unaccompanied migration of children since 1990 during the Civil Wars in Central America. We had big waves of children who were coming over. Many of the young, the boys age 14 were deserters from the military. They, they, the armies would go, and I've seen this myself, into the villages and just get boys and put them in the army and kids would, you know, get ter traumatized by war and then they run and they run all the way, keep running and try to make it to the U.S. Okay, and here's just some, some background. We've heard like a lot of poverty, etc. And a couple of things I want to show you here is, for, and I want to compare U.S. and Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. Infant mortality rate, the number of death of infants below the age of one, okay, between when they're born before they get to one. And infant mortality rate is a good rough indicator of conditions in a country when they're terrible and poor and people are suffering. So the higher the infant mortality rate, right, the worse conditions are in that society. In the U.S., this year, 2013, our infant mortality rate is like 5.9 infants per 1,000 live birth before the age of one die. But if you look at, look at Guatemala, okay, so it's like infants are f more than four times more likely to die in Guatemala than in the U.S. 
Okay, in, in, in Central America, except for El Salvador, conditions are even worse, you know, in, than what we find in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So these are indicators of very uh, few resources of health care and, and good jobs and family income. And this is harsh poverty that, that killing infants. And I'm, when I'm talking about, what do they die from? Diarrhea. I get diarrhea, I go to the drugstore, get back to this mall. I'm okay by the evening. Places that I've been to in the highlands of Guatemala, many infants die of diarrhea. There is no drugstore. There is, even if there was, they don't have money to buy anything. So that's what we're talking about. And those countries are like the rest of developed, the, the global south, are, are the fastest growing, growing countries. They're producing more population. Total fertility rate is large families. The number of, kind of like the average number of children a woman has here by the time she has her fertility, uh, fertility age, right? So big families. And here's the percent of the population of the country that's 15 years of age or, or less than 15. So you can see these are populations that have a lot of children. Right. And so we have that. Okay. And this is just my economic comparison here. Like uh, GMP, this is, if you think of like per capita, think of like income, uh, person to power parity, and here we are, right? And then also, you can see those are very poor countries, right? Making very little money, harsh poverty. I mean, we know that conditions are hard in Mexico, but Central America is like you've gone down to another level, you know, extreme poverty. They have, this is during the recession, so we, we didn't do it too well here. Those countries did well, but they're small economies, many agricultural economies, so they increase production of coffee, bananas or something, and so this number is going to go up. But the question becomes, so if you have population growth, who gets the, who gets the profits? How is wealth distributed? And then we look at the poorest 20% of the population, what percent of total income do they get? Look at Honduras. The bottom 20% of the population gets only 2% of total income in the country. I mean, they're almost getting nothing. Okay. We're talking about extreme, absolute poverty. And what about the richest 20% of the population? They get 60%. They almost walk away with all, you know, well, not all, but big, big chunk. So a very unequal distribution of wealth. Now, we're not doing so well ourselves, okay? <laughs> so, I'm not just going to point to Honduras. We're not. I tell you a country that does well, Japan. I've been to Japan several times, and to me, it's like, it's all middle class. I'm exaggerating. It's not all middle class, but it's a lot more middle class than we are. You know, and so that's one of, you know, what's driving this, Mike, when we talk about absolute poverty, this is what we're talking about. It's not just that people are poor, it's a huge inequality, you know, severe inequality in a country that's already poor. Okay. We talk about violence driving the migration of youth or attack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is from the Pew Research Center. And this is scary. Okay. Look at the homicide rate. Murders for 100,000 inhabitants. Look at Honduras. Nine. Honduras leads the world, right? And, and yeah, we have more kids coming from Honduras, okay? And so 90.4 is their homicide rate. Then you drop down to 41.2 for El Salvador, 39.9 Guatemala, that's high. Even this is high, Mexico, 21.5. You know what the U.S. is? 4.7. 4.7. I feel safe now. <laughs> what this says is that you're, you're 18 times more likely, 18 times more likely to be murdered in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, than you are in San Antonio. Okay? But, but, do you get it now? I mean, this is like scary stuff. And here's what's even scarier. This country's, I don't know about Mexico, but Renee can tell us, they don't have 911. You get attacked, you're on your own. Your brothers and sisters better come out and help you. They don't have 911. 
You don't call 911 because you do. It's the police that's attacking you or kidnapping you. There's a, I do, a, for two decades, I've been going to the Guatemalan Highlands to communities where I do migration research. And uh, so I looked at my notes. This is a, in the province of Totonicapan. Anybody from Guatemala? Or, okay, I'm in the, so I can, I can stretch my, my <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, the municipio, the township, small county of uh, San Cristobal, Totonicapan, where a lot of migration to Houston, especially, but all over. And all from the highlands all over into the U.S. It to San Antonio, right? And so looking at conditions affecting youth migration in the Guatemalan highlands. Family separation, exactly what Harriet told us. That families come over, they're locked in. We have almost 12, 11.7 million undocumented immigrants. It's a sign of success. We're doing such a great job at border control. People are afraid to leave because they know they can't come back to their jobs, so they stay here. And I've met migrants who haven't seen their parents, except for Skype now, stuff like that, for many years, right? And so children grow up. They're left with their grandmother. The grandmother dies or it gets too old to control them. And then so they want to come and look for their parents. They want to come look for their father. They want to come look for their older brother. And so that's something that drives the migration, to come and look for family members. Uh, I know other youth who migrated because their friends migrated and they decided to migrate together. Okay. Uh, it's like Harriet said, there are cultures of migration throughout Central America and migration is a right of passage for, for boys who, who think they've become men now and, and, and need to migrate. We've created this migration system uh, and I say we because I'm thinking of U.S. employers and institutions that create a labor market for Central American labor. I used to go, our labor market went into Mexico, and now we went further into Central America. And people there know that when they grow up, they're going to come to the U.S. to look for work. Uh, families collapse, their family members die, uh, there's illness, there's no control of the older children, the children become homeless, and then they join other kids, and then they start migrating into Mexico, and from Mexico into the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. Fear of violence, very present. If a brother or older cousin gets killed by a gang, a mara, then younger children may decide they're going to migrate to because they're afraid that that's going to happen to them. And so they move. So those are some of the things that, that I've seen in San Cristobal and other highland communities that I've studied that's creating this push factor of children. Where's the time? Violence in the in the in the highlands. The situation is not just that there's violence in the highlands, violence, but in the context of a weak state, in a, in, a, in a context where you don't expect your government to do anything because they don't have the resources or whatever. They don't have the organization for it. They, they as I said, there is no one nine one one to call. You know, and so in the communities where I study, I hear some of the violence. Threats against families for extortion or remittances. One of the things that's happening now is so much migration, a lot of money being sent by migrants in the U.S. back to their families. The gangs find out which families are receiving monthly checks from the U.S. and they go hit those families. They want a percent of the remittances every month and they give them a bank account and they tell them every month put so much $100 into this bank account or $50 or $200, depends how much you're getting. It's getting so hard for me to do research because families don't want to identify themselves as migrant families because they're afraid that the gangs are going to find out, come and hit them. Uh, some of the migrant families are building homes. I mean, this is happening all over. It happened in Mexico. It's happening in Central America with the remittances building homes. And so gangs find out who owns the homes and they do home invasions. Go in, tie everybody up, take all the appliances out, whatever. That, that they can sell later and then leave, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing that, I, and I don't have any data on this, but I, it, the only thing that's different from the U.S. home invasion is it seems like well, they don't kill you. You, you just cooperate. You know, and I know in the U.S., even if you don't cooperate, you can get killed in a home invasion, or at least in Houston. Uh, in the communities where I've been, the kidnappings, uh, a small hotel owner had his daughter kidnapped and killed. And another kid 
kidnapping of uh, a prominent political figure's family member. So this is levels of violence, attempted robberies by armed assailants, usually with knives, uh, something shooting of bus drivers who refuse to share passenger fares with gangs up in the highlands. The gangs are hitting the bus drivers. The bus is privately owned. And so people, most people don't have cars, so they make money and the gangs want the bus drivers to hand over part of the, the fares. Robbery and murder of smugglers. Smuggling is a very dangerous business because you carry a lot of cash because you've got to pay off police in Mexico or Central America or even maybe in, in the U.S. And the bandits know that you're carrying money, so the bandits are hitting on the, on the smugglers. And I had I knew two smugglers, and both have been killed by, by bandits. Assault and rape of young women by gangs, maras on the Pan American Highway. There are some highways that are traveled a lot by gangs. And migrant youth in the Pan American Highway is a major one. And so if you're in a community that's in the Pan American Highway, you're going to get a lot of traffic of kids, some of them who are with the gangs, etc. Other levels of, of violence in the highlands, the killing of political candidates, it's still going. That didn't stop until the whole civil war ended. It, it continues, right? They just don't call it a civil war anymore. Killing of human rights workers continues. And in, uh, where I do research, there was, in October the 4th, the Guatemalan Army and the National Police came and they shot at Mayan protesters. They were protesting you know, some kind of constitutional reform. They killed four and wounded many more, right? But equally violent is, is the poverty that's maintained by unequal distribution of wealth because it deprives people of the ability to, to, to have a good quality of life, or to keep their children alive, et cetera, et cetera. How are we do five minutes? Mm -hmm. This is a community where I do research. This is the Pan American Highway. Here are the private buses. And so I, all along the Pan American Highway, Highway 1, you see these bus stops. And this are, many of these are migrants. They're getting ready to go. Some of them are going to go into Guatemala City. They have, to have visas, and they're going to fly into Houston, et cetera, et cetera. Others are not. They're going to take the bus to get to the Mexican border, and then, or they're coming with smuggler, et cetera. So it's many, not all of these, but many are, are, are migrants who are heading out uh, to migrate. Dangers in the journey. In the 1990s, I did a survey of, which was a large team of public health workers and psychologists who were looking for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD among migrant children. And so we used a questionnaire that was divided into three parts. Tell us the, the potential traumatic events you experienced in your home country during the Civil War. And we say potentially traumatic because not every child would react to the same event the same way. Okay. At home, during the journey to the U.S. and after you enter the U.S. And here are the, the types of, of, of dangers they experience physically. Uh, in the journey to the, to the U.S., physical assault, some kids, uh, sexual assault, especially of the girls, robbery, extreme hunger, serious health problems, especially the girls, some of the, the kids have been kidnapped, victimized by police. This is a constant and even today when I interview migrants, this is still reported, you know. And it reported a lot for Mexico, uh, because Mexico is a long, it's, it's a long country, and you have to spend a lot of time crossing it. And, and there, but there are abusive police everywhere, not just in Mexico. Even in the U.S., in earlier this year, Border Patrol kidnapped a young migrant, took her to his apartment, I think he assaulted her, and then he committed suicide. You know, something that can happen anymore. Some of the children are exploited by workers. Some of the children had a family member die in the migration. Some of the children fell off the train, on top of the train, and right, broke bones, whatever. In our study in the early 1990s, we found that the children experienced potentially traumatic events in, back home in their war zones, about 3.8 different types of events. Mm -hmm. not, not frequency, but different types. And then they experienced potentially traumatic events, the number that we calculated it was 3.7, meaning that for the children, the journey, the migration, one minute, is, is about, the migration is the same as being in a war zone for children, okay? It's very uh, traumatic. And then to end with my one last minute, 
This is on uh, Highway 77 before you hit 59 near Victoria, okay, where 19 migrants died in the back of a truck, 18 wheeler. There was a father and his son from Guatemala. I think the son was seven years old. One of the 19 who died there. And so, what? How do we solve all of this? There are many things that need to be done. You know, some things immediately that Eric has talked about. But you know, there are big things that we need to do. Right? We have large numbers of people in this country who are undocumented. It doesn't help anyone to have these large numbers. They're already here. Okay, and they've been here for a long time. Here, the estimated numbers by DH, Department of Homeland Security of Central America, the big numbers, right? And we know that. I've been involved in other research uh, with undocumented immigrants who don't, who are separated from family because they're undocumented, and we find that it, it generates a lot of stress, uh, and it's something that that pushes youth to migrate. So we need a new law for migrants to be able to travel home and visit their families and children. Right? We need to to maintain the family unit for those migrants, right? But as Harriet said, Congress is not acting. It's become a political base for a game or something. And so, and Congress will not act because there's a huge social cost for not having this new law. And this is part of it, okay? But Congress doesn't pay, pay this cost. Who pays this cost? These people do, and the children, right? So whatever we can do, you know, to, to, to uh, encourage our, our Representatives, that we need, we really need a new law. And that doesn't mean I open up the border. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who've been here, productive, contributing to society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Give it, give those families a chance. My minute is up. So thank you very much. <laughs>